everyone. Thanks for hanging around to this um, last talk for the day. Um, so as the title of the talk would suggest, we're attempting to summarize PyCon 2015 in Montreal in 30 minutes. Why would we want to do that? Um, well, there's lots of conferences around the world on PyCon every year. The PyCon US is really the biggest one. And paradoxically, they haven't been holding it in the US for a couple of years. Uh, they've actually been holding it in Montreal. So it's the biggest gathering of Python freaks in the world. And it's really where you have to be if you want to be on the cutting edge of what's happening in Python. Uh, so all of us in this room are interested in Python somehow. None of us really have a good excuse for not being there. Um, so that's so that's why I'm here. Yes, cost is one thing. Um, so um, we did some back of the envelope calculations last night. How much it would cost to to attend? It comes to around thirty grand probably if you have to take into account your plane tickets and your accommodation and everything like that. So one way of looking at this talk is not really as a thirty-minute talk, but maybe more as like a thirty grand cost saving for yourself. Um, another way of looking at it, at it is uh, a time saving. Uh, you, you could, you could um, have gone to, to FireCon Montreal, but it would probably have taken about, I don't know, two, two weeks or so out of your life with all the, the flying and, and everything. It's quite a long conference. So not only uh, are you sitting here and saving 30 grand, you are also adding two weeks to your useful life expectancy, which is very good. So let's get started. Where this all fits in, there's about 40 annual Python conferences. If you go to pycon.org, you can get a list of those. I think it's between 40 and 50, depending on, on which you count. Um, these include PyCon. So PyCon ZA is also kind of part of the PyCon franchise. Um, then there's EuroPython, because the Europeans want to do it slightly differently. Um, there's also DjangoCon and DjangoCon in, in Europe as well. I think it's DjangoCon EU. And then there's dedicated conferences for the more um, number crunching stuff, the SciPy and PyData. Um, the biggest one, as I said, is, is PyCon US. And this year, it was held in Montreal. Um, it, it featured two full days of just tutorial sessions with 36 different tutorials on the schedule, each of them lasting three hours. So that right there is already about 100 hours worth of material. The main conference lasts for three days. It's five tracks, so at any, any given time, you have to choose between what's probably five pretty good talks. Um, and you can only watch one at a time. And there's over 3,000 attendees, so it's, it's really quite massive. Um, and after the three-day main conference, there's also four days of sprints, and many people end up staying for those. It's apparently a lot of fun. Um, so if you wanted to... Um, if you couldn't attend and you still wanted to be updated, you can still go to pyvelo.org. They have a list of about 134 different recordings from this year's PyCon. And all of it is on YouTube, so it's all free, and you can go watch it. So if you're a real Python fanboy, um, go to YouTube, search for PyCon US 2015, and sit yourself down on the couch. We're all um, used to this term called binge watching. So what it would be like to go through all the PyCon Montreal material, it would, be, it would take about as long as watching all five seasons of Breaking Bad three times. <laughs> You'd watch it twice for the, for the tutorials and then another once for, for all the talks. And if you're not keen on Breaking Bad, you could get yourself a hell of a lot of Kevin Spacey. You could watch all of the House of Cards seasons uh, five times. In the same time, it would take you to go through all of the talks of PyCon Montreal. OK, so uh, it's not really possible to condense everything into 30 minutes. I actually lied. I'm just going to give you my quick um, overview of my 10 favorite talks that I found. And afterwards, if, if any of them pique your interest, they are on YouTube. And you can go and find them and watch yourself and educate yourself. It's pretty cool. So to start off with, you have to start with a start. Um, Guido's keynote. For those of you who are new to Python, Guido van Rossum is the guy who started Python quite a while ago. He is Dutch, but otherwise he's quite fine. Um, he's known as the benevolent dictator for life of PyCon. Um, and his talk can, he, he talks quite a lot, but it can be summarized as Python 3, Python 3, Python 3, and then diversity, diversity, diversity. 
Both of these are really good topics, so I'm glad you talked quite a lot about it. On the Python 3 um, topic, the most memorable quote was, yes, you should all be, what, uh, be using Python 3, and I know you all want to, but I know it's difficult, and then blah, 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 blah. So we've decided to give you five more years. So he's kind of pr pragmatic about it. I think the, the consensus is that if you're starting something new, Python 3 should be the default. There's no real good reason not to use it. But obviously a lot of us have big legacy code bases and it doesn't make sense to just spend a lot of time porting that just yet. But it depends on your situation. Um, on diversity, um, he, he didn't say too much. He, uh, one thing he, he said that, that I found interesting was that there's there hasn't been any female um, committers to, to the py Python core, um, which I don't know. And then he made like a, a personal commitment to actually uh, mentor and train any female um, developers who want to commit to, to Python core. So I thought that was quite a, a cool thing. Um, in, in the States and in Europe, the, the whole diversity issue is very much um, a male-female thing at the moment. And uh, we're in South Africa, I think we all know that uh, diversity goes a lot further than that. You gotta not just have a few girls on your team and think uh, you've, you're, you're diverse. So um, yeah, he, he, he didn't really have any solutions for how we can make our teams more, di more diverse. And I know it's a really difficult problem. My own two cents um, on this topic is that it is a very difficult problem to solve. If you are sitting with a bunch of middle-aged guys, um, to suddenly make it diverse is very difficult. So rather go for solving the easier problem. And each time you set up a new team to build a new product, or you set up a new startup, or a new project or something, try and make it diverse from the start. Try and make sure your first couple of hires or the first people you get interested are not like you. And then it's actually quite easy to keep a team diverse once it starts off diverse. But otherwise, it's a much more difficult problem to solve. So that wasn't Guida, that was just my two cents. The, the next talk uh, that was really good is, is this keynote by um, a guy called Jacob Kaplan Moss. Now he's one of the guys who started Django way back when, um, and he's still a core developer. And he's got a very fancy job, and he gives a lot of talks at, at uh, conferences. And um, generally, you'd have a lot of respect for this guy technically, you probably wouldn't just take him on in an argument. Um, but he basically came out saying that uh, quite often he finds himself in situations where he feels maybe he's not that smart. Maybe his technical know-how is a little bit inadequate. Maybe he does write bad code every now and then. You know, um, and he, he gave it a name, they call it the imposter syndrome. And it, it ended up being a bit of a theme of the conference. And I think we can all recognize it. Uh, we, we all feel that from time to time, especially in a place like this, you're in a room full of lots of clever people uh, it's quite easy to think that maybe these people know something that I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I make obvious mistakes that they all see and know about. Um, that kind of thing. I, and my key take out from this is, if even this guy feels that, um, whenever I get that feeling, just get over it. We all feel it. Life carries on. Uh, you, you're not stupid. Cool. Um, a third talk that I found very interesting was this one by Nina Zakarenko called technical debt, the code monster in your closet. Uh, so what is technical debt? It's basically a series of bad decisions. And those could, could have been technical decisions or business decisions um, I that happened in the past that's keeping you from doing your job today, that's keeping you from rolling out that new feature or from fixing that bug or whatever it is. And um, we all know what it looks like. I mean, we've all, we've all worked on code bases that don't quite work in the way you would expect. Um, so I found this talk uh, uh, really, really interesting. Um, she starts off by basically saying that we all cause it. We're all the reason for it. Um, uh, we, we all write bad code sometimes. And, and there are reasons for it. There are tight deadlines. There are sometimes features that are bad ideas, but you just don't want to say no to your boss. Um, sometimes there's scope creep. Uh, those, th those kind of things happen. So in a talk, she goes through how you can spot technical debt kind of code, code smiles and stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, it's quite, quite, quite useful for, for being a bit more critical on your own, own code. And then she proposes some solutions, um, like setting realistic expectations. Uh, you, can't, you can't write really good code in, in a day if you also have to write really good tests and make sure it's maintainable and everything. Um, 
uh, pair, pair programming, code reviews, those kind of things, and then definitely testing, automated testing. Um, yeah, so I found that quite good. Uh, next up is, oh yeah, there's this one uh, really interesting quote. She didn't say it first time, um, I st I'm not sure who coined it, but all these coders of the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. Now, I luckily don't have this problem. My previous job was with code for SA, but they are, they are hiring and I don't know who they're gonna hire next, so you know. Yeah, okay, so next up there's this guy called Raymond Hettinger. He gave two talks, but this one was on PIP8. Um, most of you will probably know what PIP8 is. It's basically like a style guide for Python. It says uh, that, that you should have an opinion on line lengths and capitalization and variable names and um, line spacing between functions and methods and things like that. And it's all very good. If you have code that, that conforms to PIP8, it's generally a bit more readable than code that doesn't. Um, so there's nothing wrong with PIP8. But um, he makes a very big point on not um, not spending too much time on it. The real uh, thing you should be focusing on is making sure you architect your code in a Pythonic way that makes sense. Um, and how he does it in his talk, you'd really have to watch it yourself to, to see it, but he basically starts off with a piece of example code and he asks the audience if they see any issues with it. And they say, no, they, it actually looks good. It's pep it's compliant, and everything's fine. And then he goes through it one by one and kind of picks off the the, this, the things that the whole audience have missed. And this is an audience full of clever Python developers, so um, I found that really, really good. So it's, it's obvious stuff sometimes like um, uh, making use of iterators and uh, or, or just, um, yeah, just looping through a list rather than declaring a counter and then uh, th things like that. Um, yeah, so it's quite useful if you are, if you find yourself sometimes not being too confident on your own kind of um, grade of Python code, this is a good talk to go through to to see uh, which kind of stuff would normally trip people up. Especially if you're coming from a different programming kind of uh, background, if you're actually more uh, better at coding Java or whatever, then you, you're probably thinking about things slightly differently. Um, yeah, so basically Pepe is great, but let's be pra pragmatic and let's focus on Pythonic structure, not just stylistic correctness. Okay, now this guy is called um, Harry Percival, and he gave a tutorial. It's uh, one of those wonderful three-hour tutorials on uh, test-driven development in Python for beginners. So if you, if you have three hours on a Saturday, basically it takes you from someone who hasn't written any tests whatsoever to someone who, who, who can understand what's the difference between a unit test and an integration test, how to write them, how to write your code so that it's more testable, and then he basically takes you through some steps building this little web app in Django. Um, so uh, a confession on my side is I didn't write any tests until about a year ago because it's it's really your job to write tests. Usually your job is to, I don't know, um, just build out features, get stuff done, um, and tests kind of take time away from that. So, um, uh, so this was a real eye-opener for me. I really um, enjoyed it quite a lot. Uh, it hasn't turned me into a real um, TDD junkie. Some people are really religious on, on tests, but it has changed the way I code. And um, basically by um, letting me focus, or teaching me to focus more on, on tiny iterations. So get a function in place and have it do something. That's fine, you can write a test for that, and that happened. Then you can go back and make it do something a bit more complicated, and you just kind of iterate and iterate, and in the end you, you end up with a a really great product, and it was tested at each step, and yeah, it just works. So, um, yeah, so I think that writing testable code makes you think a bit differently about the code that you write, and, and that's a very good thing. So if you are new to testing, that's a very good tutorial to, to check out. The guy also wrote the book on, on test-driven development, so um, yeah, it's quite quite nice. You can you can get all the materials and stuff um, uh, through through watching this tutorial. There's links to everything. Okay. Uh, next up, Julia Evans. Um, if you if you want to, uh, she, she called it spying on your programs here. But if you, you if you're looking for it on Google, it's called systems programming as a Swiss Army knife. And basically, what she's um, referring to as systems programming is uh, 
what if you treat your program as a, as a black box and you just look at what's going in and what's going out? How much memory is this thing using? Is it writing to disk? Is it making network calls, things like that? Um, can you still debug what's going on there? And uh, you know, how would you go about that? So it's really um, not a Python talk per se. It's more of a, um, a talk on, on using your, your operating system and the, the, the calls it comes with. Um, and um, yeah, basically all it comes down to is if you write a, a Python program that does anything, uh, it does it through the operating system and it, it does it through what's called system calls. And those things you can have a look at. You can, uh, w without knowing anything of what's, what's going on inside the program itself. Um, so that's quite useful. Yes, some examples of um, of Linux commands that you could use to to debug stuff specifically on Linux. So there's strace, which lets you literally see a list of all the system calls being made. So things like write and open are quite useful. For example, say you're writing a, a or, or some program is, is running, and it reads in some config file from somewhere. You don't know where the config file is, but um, if you use strace to run the, the thing, you'll somewhere have to see an open call to some kind of file to read the config file, and then you know where it is. So that kind of thing can be can be really useful. There's ngrep ngrep for um, taking a look at what's going on um, on a specific port. Just taking a look at the raw network traffic with all the headers and everything. Um, there's time, which is really simple for for benchmarking. So if you're running a Python script, you'd, you'd say Python um, and then the name of the script and you'd run. If you want to, to time it, you just say time, Python and the script and run. And then it would just run through the script and at the end give you some feedback on how long it took, um, which is pretty useful. Uh, especially if you're trying to build an API or something and you, you want it to be, to be snappy. The last one there is dstat, which, um, which you'd run in a terminal and it would just continuously tell you how much data is being written or read at any given moment by the operating system. And an interesting uh, use case for this was uh, she was uh, debugging this one script uh, that she benchmarked with time, and it ran quite fast. So you're writing this thing, you want it to be snappy, you run it, it's fast, you feel good about yourself, you go get a copy, then you come back and you run it again and you run it again, and you see that the second time it's actually slow. But, but why? It's, it's doing exactly the same thing. And it turns out that, for example, if you are writing a lot of stuff to disk, um, th your program will ask the operating system to write stuff to disk. The operating system will come back and say, OK, cool, we've got it. But it, it puts it in the buffer. And then it's still writing to disk by the time that your program's already exited. So you can think that you've written a Python program that's really snappy, but the operating system's kind of covering for you. And then if that gets called repeatedly, you'd pick it up immediately with dstat that there's just a lot of stuff going to disk. So I found that quite interesting. Um, after watching that talk, you'll feel slightly more like the guy from Mr. Robot and a bit more, a bit less uh, like just a regular douchebag. <laughs> cool. Um, next up is this talk uh, by Christoph Pettis on Postgres. It's not a talk, it's also a three hour tutorial. So um, Postgres for me is quite a, it's become a bit of a default purely because of, um, of uh, the the post GIS stuff the 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 geographical plugin basically any app or service or something that you build nowadays is going to have some kind of geographical uh, component to it you saw it with the stuff that Greg demoed earlier um, with all the maps and stuff uh, th that's all stuff that, that that really needs to be handled in the database uh, if it's to be done efficiently um, so uh, on on the other hand though Postgres is a real big beast and um, it can be very intimidating. Uh, the command line is interface to Postgres is not super user friendly or pretty or anything, um, and there is a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of stuff um, that could go wrong in a database if you're not an expert on on databases. So I found this talk really really um, interesting. He takes you through a lot of the basics, um, it, and he tells you some of the stuff that uh, Postgres is good at, um, and some of the stuff it sucks at. Like uh, apparently, doing a count star on a very large table in Postgres is actually really inefficient. There's other databases that does that uh, much quicker. And doing paging in Postgres is apparently also quite inefficient. There are other databases that do it better. So it's nice to know that, then you can design your way around it. Um, 
uh, then he spends a lot of time talking about JSON, uh, uh, sorry, uh, database replication, which is also something that Greg mentioned earlier. Um, the whole thing around database replication is really complicated, and he, he takes you through how to set it up so that you can have a failover database, and you can basically um, guarantee uptime for your for your uh, service, whatever it is. But the, the, the take out from that is if you can at all avoid that um, and pay rather pay Amazon to, to manage that complexity for you, um, you've really saved yourself a lot of time. So um, before watching this talk, that might have been something that I would have taken on. I would have like, yeah, let's quickly figure out replication in the morning. Um, after watching the talk, I think uh, I have a healthy respect for, for that and I would rather let uh, Amazon take care of it or whatever other services are out there. Um, and then he also talks a bit about the native JSON data type in, in Postgres, which is really cool. Uh, we, we tend to use JSON quite a lot if, you, if you're building web services that talk to each other. And in Postgres, you can just push that JSON into, uh, into a field uh, on the database just like it is. It's, uh, it's really cool. And then you can query the individual JSON fields inside of that on the database. So that really makes things uh, much more efficient than going and querying the database, passing all the JSON, and then kind of querying the JSON fields in your Python application. So that's a nice thing to be, just to be aware of. Um, um, yeah, but that's, uh, that's about it for Postgres. So the, the, the talk's titled PostgreSQL Proficiency for Python People, and it's by Christoph Pettis. Then there's this guy, um, David Beasley. Now he's a regular at Python conferences. You'll find lots and lots and lots of talks um, that he, he's given on, on YouTube. Um, this particular one that he gave is called Python Concurrency from the Ground Up. So Python Concurrency is, uh, for example, the, the twisted stuff that uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned, or Tornado, or I think there's a couple of other frameworks you can use for doing asynchronous stuff. Um, and basically, it comes it comes down to to writing a program that can one and run process without sucking, without uh, blocking on specific things like network calls or waiting for for stuff to be written to disk or whatever. So there's um, d during this talk, he basically goes through the, the, the only two methods of implementing uh, concurrency in Python. So it's it's the methods that Tornado would be using uh, or, or Twisted would be using under the under the hood. The one is thread pools and the one is coroutines. And then he goes through some different ways of doing both. And the, the plus, uh, the kind of the, the upsides and the downsides to all of them. And um, in the end, the, the takeaway is, if you can write your program not to use concurrency, that's the first prize. Um, otherwise, try and have functions that are as simple as possible. And make sure that nowhere in your application do you have objects or things that are sharing state, because then things just get terribly confusing when um, when things are happening asynchronously and the state is updated by one and you're not kind of expecting it yet. And yeah, so um, yeah, but if possible, avoid concurrency. It is complicated. It is difficult to maintain. Things break in unexpected ways. So if you can. Uh, break the task down into stuff that can be done in separate processes, then rather just have like five Python processes processes chunking through the data doing it. Or maybe even multiple machines, you know, spawn lots of uh, virtual machines on, on some cloud provider and, and just do it that way. It will probably save you some time. Now he also gave um, a nice and long tutorial, a three hour tutorial at the same conference. Modules and packages live and let die. Now these these um, tutorials are three hours long, so you might ask, you know, a module is simply a file with some Python in it uh, that you can run. A package is just a folder with some files with Python in it, and then maybe an init file. So what on earth would you uh, be doing for three hours uh, talking about that? But it's quite fascinating. Like he goes through all the, the ins and outs of how these things work, what gets imported first, uh, what gets imported last, how can these things conflict, and um, if you've come across your, uh, if you come across, if, you, if you've ever worked on a really complicated uh, Python application, you will know that these things can get 
pretty tricky after a while. You, you run into circular imports and you don't always know what's, what's loaded when and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so w watching through this tutorial uh, can help you a lot to wrap your head around that. And I found that very useful. And he's quite an entertaining speaker, so it won't be three hours wasted. Um, then lastly, but not least, I'm, I think I might uh, be violating the code of conduct because I want to do a shameless plug for my web framework of choice. There's a, uh, <laughs> there's a three hour tutorial on, on Flask. Um, what's cool about it is if you, if you are new to Flask and you're, you're looking for some something to, to teach you, one of the first things you'll come across is the, the Flask mega tutorial. And it's written by this guy, Miguel Greenberg. And then he's also just published a book on Flask uh, with O'Reilly. And um, here the guy gives you basically three hours of one-on-one, -on -one almost. Um, I mean, you, you have the opportunity of, of watching through that. And he just um, builds a, s a sample web app with Python and Git and, um, and some testing and stuff. And it's, it's really a, a very good entry point. So um, if, you, if you are new to, to web development and you want to try out Flask, it's a, it's a nice place to start. Um, and then that's that. The, the whole YouTube um, playlist for these 10 talks are, um, are over there. So you can snap that with your, with your phone and you'll find it. Um, otherwise, you could just Google it. Um, yeah, and that's it. Any questions? Any questions? I should give one uh, quick disclaimer. I did not actually attend the conference. I, <laughs> <laughs> I just have um, weird habits, and I do watch a lot of these talks um, while I'm cooking and yeah, like at weird times. So, yeah. Um, my question is, how many hours of Icon Montreal have you watched? <laughs> I wanted to log it, and I, at first, at first, my idea was to try and watch all of it. Um, but then I actually did the math and realized <laughs> how prohibitive that was. Um, no, so I would have to say probably about uh, 50 to 60 hours. I didn't watch everything. And it's quite easy, um, because it's YouTube, you, you, you try out a talk and if it's not your thing, you just turn it off. It's not, you don't lose anything. Wasn't paying quite enough attention. Did you watch the talk of um, asynchronous IO from the ground up? No, I did not. That's really good to get out. Okay, cool. Um, one other plus point of, of um, watching these conference talks um, on YouTube, especially the tutorials, is tutorials tend to take a long time, and, and a lot of the time is spent on debugging people's personal um, setup and things like that. But if it's a video, you can just skip to the next part you're interested in. So it, it is quite an efficient way of going through this stuff. Cool. If that's it, thank you very much, Beatrice. Cool. Thanks.